Are you curious about what all the fuss is about with publishing research? What is a journal's impact factor and why does it matter? All of this and more on today's episode of The Secret Life of Numbers. Welcome to the Secret Life of Numbers podcast, the podcast where we dissect everyday numbers and statistics to find the stories behind them. Each episode, we take a number or statistic and break it down. We will tell you where it comes from and what it means for you. Along the way, hopefully we will inspire you to think about the numbers in your own life. I'm LaVanya, your data scientist on call. I'll be breaking down the numbers. I'm Lindsay, your data translator. For when LaVanya gets too technical on us, I'll be breaking down the rest. All right, let's jump in. This is the second episode in our mini series about science communication. Yeah, and this one I think is really exciting because it kind of pulls back the curtain on the process of actually what do you do with your research findings and how do you share it with other people in your field? In our first episode, we talked about qualitative versus quantitative research. Or I'm not sure if it should be versus, but qualitative and quantitative research because it's not a competition which is like fundamentally how you conduct the research and the techniques that you're going to use. And this episode, I think, is a little bit more about how scientists communicate to each other and how the numbers that we use or that matter to us when we're communicating to each other. And then I think our last episode about reading level is going to be about how we then communicate it to everyone else. So we're kind of going full circle from, you know, picking the methods to finishing the project and now sharing it with the world. (laughs) Yes. So I guess I hope that this doesn't feel too niche, like how scientists communicate to each other, but it does matter because it does impact how we will then communicate to the rest of the world. Well, I think it's important too, because a lot of times the decisions that we make, if you want those decisions to be data-driven, oftentimes you need the literature to back you up on what you should do. And a lot of primary literature too, which is like original research that uncovers something new, a lot of it trickles down to mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And it's important to understand how research is published in order to be able to understand it in its own context. If you're, you know, come across it in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or (laughs) um, CTV News or wherever you get your news. Hopefully it's not too niche, but even if you aren't someone who's going to publish an academic paper, I think it's very interesting to learn about the pitfalls and challenges of publishing. Yes, because ultimately the papers that do well scientist to scientist will be the ones, I think, that you are more likely to hear outside of the science world. Absolutely. And more likely in mainstream media. Lev, do you want to provide like a quick, broad brushstrokes overview of what the numbers are for this episode? Sure. So I have two numbers and a process to talk about in terms of how scientists communicate their results to each other. Where do we want to start? Well, I think the process leads to the numbers. So we can start with the process. This might be something that many of our listeners have heard of, but the way science is published is through a process called peer review. Yes, exactly. Which (laughs) sounds kind of random. It's like, oh, do you give it to your friends to look over? (laughs) In its core, it tries to be quite systematic and as objective, I think, as possible. Just like in broad strokes, what this process entails, I pulled this from Wiley, which is like a publishing company that publishes many scientific journals, and they describe the peer review process in 10 steps. First, the paper that you want to publish, so your scientific research, is submitted. Then there's like an editorial office assessment. It's more about like, do you have the right sections? Are your references adequate? That sort of thing. And then you go into appraisal by the editor-in-chief of the journal. 
This is the first check to see whether or not you'll be accepted or rejected into their journal. And some reasons why a paper might be rejected by the editor-in-chief might be like, perhaps it's just not the type of paper that that journal publishes. There's so many different reasons. I think a lot of times it does come down to scope of the journal, like what sort of research they publish. Like you said, like it could be a different field. It could be just methods they don't really publish. Yeah, I mean, like you wouldn't publish a paper about marine biology in like a neuroscience journal. Yeah, because ultimately they want the papers that they publish in their journal to be high quality, of course, and original and interesting, but they want to be applicable to their reader base. So the neurosurgeons aren't like, gee, what are the manatees up to? Like they could be, but (laughs) they wouldn't go to the neurosurge journals for that. (laughs) Yeah. So then I guess in Wiley journals, they then assign like an associate editor who like helps the paper move through the rest of the process. Step five to step 10 is really when like peer review begins because step five is the invitation to reviewers. So here, the invitations, I guess, are sent out to reviewers to review this paper. And you need to get a sufficient number of responses for the paper to be like adequately reviewed. Then step six is the response to those invitations. So a reviewer can decide to review the paper or not. Once the invitations are accepted and there's sufficient invitations per the journal's regulations or rules that the paper can be sufficiently peer-reviewed, then the review is actually conducted. So each of these reviewers will independently and often anonymously, or actually almost always anonymously, review the papers and provide feedback or criticisms of the paper. And then the journal evaluates those reviews in step eight. And I think you can have what's called major or minor revisions to a paper, But in both cases, if there are revisions, then the paper goes back to the authors and they make those revisions. And oftentimes this is like a back and forth process as well. Like you're communicating with your reviewers about the decisions you're making and hopefully improving the paper overall. Yeah, they often bring up points that are like maybe weaknesses of the paper that can be improved. And I think oftentimes that leads to a better paper. And sometimes too, there's things that you write in a research paper that you're like, this makes sense. This is easy to understand. And then Mm -hmm. when you get that outside feedback from someone who's not affiliated with the project at all, it helps you identify areas where maybe your point isn't as clear. Sometimes you, you spend so much time looking at your own research that you can't see its flaws and you need that outside perspective. The forest through the trees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this is one of the things that peer review is meant to do. It's meant to look at the paper from an outside perspective and evaluate it. And oftentimes like a question will be raised and the author might go back and run like a small little experiment and include those new results in the next revision of the paper if it answers a question from a reviewer. But finally, when all the reviews or like all the revisions are done, the decision is made about whether or not the paper will be published. And then if it will be published, it goes into production and it's published in the journal. Yeah, (laughs) my papers are still filtering through this process to hopefully one day hit production and publication. But it can be a very long process too. There's kind of this joke that like, you know, oh, like I'm finally ready to publish my paper. And it's like, are you? Have you gone through the four-month period where you didn't hear back (laughs) from the journal at all and you didn't know what was going on? You questioned the validity of your own research? And it's like, yep, been there. (laughs) That's true. There are a lot of papers that these journals are filtering through to decide whether or not they want to publish them in their journals. Like, are they within the scope? Do they meet their their journal's criteria of rigor and robustness? All of those things. Mm Mm-hmm. In this process that we've gone through, it's really meant overall to help researchers. There are some criticisms of the process, but a good peer review process should do a few things. I found this paper that quite succinctly sums it up. Peer review should prevent publication of bad work. So hopefully within your peer group, you're filtering out studies that are like poorly executed, poorly designed, poorly analyzed. Or if they do have elements of that, they're improved in the peer review process. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that 
peer review is trying to check as much as possible from the submitted material that the research reported has been carried out well and there are no flaws in the design or methodology. And as far as possible, I guess is important to note because ultimately a peer reviewer can't tell if you misrepresented your results, like, or if you change numbers, for example. Like, hopefully a scientist will not do that, but peer review can't detect fraud. Yeah, the role isn't policing. It's, like, Mm -hmm. working on, like, the integrity of the research, the validity of the methodology, the rigor of Mm -hmm. what the researchers did, and and how a lot of times, too, it's critiquing, like, how well is the paper written? Mm -hmm. Because you could be the best scientist ever and do the most amazing experiments, but if you can't write it and communicate it, (laughs) it's going to be just not as strong. Yeah. Uh, Another thing they mentioned is that peer review should ensure that the work is reported correctly and unambiguously, complying with reporting guidelines where appropriate and with acknowledgement to the existing body of work and due credit given to the findings and ideas of others. There's a lot in there. (laughs) Yeah, that goes down to the structure of the paper. Like, are you interpreting your results correctly? Are you also interpreting the literature correctly that your work is based upon? And I think these all sound too like, oh, like, of course you would do that. But it's amazing how many times <laughs> it's not done or like corners are cut or, you know, there's pressure just to get a publication out. Mm-hmm. And I think also between the time you write a paper and the time it goes through peer review, there can be new literature published as well. So like this check is not a bad one to make sure that your like research is like 100 percent up to date. Yeah, it can be a long time. So then the fourth is like ensure the results presented have been interpreted correctly and all possible interpretation is considered. I kind of view that one as like, are your methods correct? Do you you perform the right tests? Are your samples adequate in order to make the claims that you're making? The fifth is to ensure the results are not too preliminary or too speculative. But then also on the flip side of that, you don't want to squash innovative thinking as well. So that's a fine line that I think reviewers walk. That's a tough one too. Yeah, because you want the research to be novel, but that also means, well, it's novel. (laughs) You want it to add to the body of work, but you don't want it to be too speculative. Six is providing editors with evidence that they can make judgments as to whether or not to include that research in their journal and also what potential impact it could have. And then seven, eight, and nine are really about the writing of the paper. Seven is about providing the authors with quality and constructive feedback. Eight is generally improving the quality and readability of the paper. And then nine is helping to maintain the integrity of the scholarly record. So with all this in mind, I guess going through the peer review process, an important part is that it's the journal that does that. So you have to pick a journal. Yes. And what do researchers use as a tool to pick a journal? I mean, I I can't speak for all researchers, but I'm pretty sure that researchers are going to think about the impact factor of the journal when they're publishing their papers or when they're looking to pick a journal to publish their paper in. Yeah, everyone wants a high impact journal. (laughs) To give you a definition of what an impact factor is, this is the average of the sum of citations received by an article in that journal in a given year or two years. Sometimes the numbers are reported differently. Right. So I guess it's a measure of the reach of the journal and how many people, I guess, maybe in its respective field, read it. Yeah, read it and then cite it or like build upon it. And this is actually, I guess, maintained independently from the journals themselves. I pulled that definition from Elsevier, which is another publishing company, and they say that their JIFs or their journal impact factors are calculated by Clarivate Analytics. So they're looking at how many times the average article in that journal is cited. We can do an example. So if you're trying to find the impact factor for 1992 for a journal, you would take the total number of citations in 1992 and we can call that A. And then B is of those citations in 1992, how many of those articles were published in 1990 to 1991, which is like a subset of A. And then C is the number of articles published in 1990 to 1991. And so then your impact factor would just be the citations 
1992 that were on articles published between 1990 to 1991 divided by the number of articles published in that same time period, so divided by C. And it's not just citations in its own journal, right? Like it's citations. Yeah, it's citations everywhere. Yeah. That's why it's maintained by like a third party. They're not just looking at citations that your paper had in that same journal. It's looking at citations in journals everywhere or to the best of their ability. Right. I think it's kind of problematic to only look at impact factor when like choosing a journal, though. I think the journal with the highest impact factor is the New England Journal of Medicine. But not every study is going to be appropriate to be published in the New England Journal of Medicine. (laughs) There's just some disciplines that are more niche than others. And as a result, like most of the papers in that discipline have a low impact factor Mm. because there's fewer people working in that area. And looking at the literature in that area, it's one metric, but it's not the only metric. Yeah. There are ways in which this number can be inflated. If your journal is publishing a lot of papers, like I'm assuming that there's like a base level citation rate that you can expect from a paper when it's published. So if you're pumping out a lot of journal issues, then you will most likely have a higher impact factor than a journal that doesn't have as many issues. Is that because there's just more chances to hit something that gets a lot of citations? Because isn't it averaged out across how many like articles they published? It's divided by the number of articles that you're publishing. But if you're putting out a lot of papers, then you will, you'll you'll get more citations too. Like there's like a baseline I would expect to see. Right. Just that overall increase. Because sometimes you might have like a group of individuals who keep citing themselves within the group. Right. Like groups of friends that cite each other's mm-hmm. papers. Or maybe not even friends, like but groups of researchers that are like citing the same few studies over or citing the same few authors over and over. And that could be because there are only a few people doing that work, or it could be that they have preferences for certain methodologies, but that's one way that that number can be increased. Right. So this is at the level of the journal. Yes. But there's also a number like this at the level of an individual author. Yes. So at the level of the author, you have what's called an H index. And this is a measure of the number of publications published, as well as how often they're cited. I'll give you the definition and then an example. So the H index is the number of publications with a citation number greater than or equal to a value H. So as an example, if you have 15 publications and they're cited 15 times or more, your H index is 15. Right. There's a complicated process behind it. Yeah, there's like a bit of ranking and some formulas that go into it. It's not as uh, simple as the journal level. Something to consider about the H index is that it's only bounded by your individual productivity as an author, but at the same time, interdisciplinary work, which will be cited in many disciplines, will obviously create H indexes that are higher. So if you are like working in an interdisciplinary field, you will have like a baseline higher H index than perhaps a more theoretical field. It's not very useful for comparing people's research projectivity across fields because like you said, like fields are very different in terms of how they cite, how often they cite. What they consider publishable. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think too, like it's not like not every project ends up in a publication, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it's not valuable work as well. For sure. I guess not every project ends up in a paper, right? Like you present it at conferences. There are different avenues as well. And maybe too, like the appropriate venue for it is not so much an academic journal. Like maybe it's something more mainstream or more related to like a community. Like there's this whole field of what we call knowledge translation Mm -hmm. about sharing scientific findings with people. And that doesn't just mean people in academic circles and universities. So we've talked about, I suppose, the system and as well as a couple numbers that are used when scientists are publishing their own work. But I'm guessing, how does this impact the type of work that gets published and ultimately, like, what reaches the mainstream, perhaps? Publishing is, it's an interesting area of 
science because Mm. there's a lot of pressure on researchers and people in a lot of different fields, really, that aren't just research. Like, for example, a lot of doctors do research. Mm. And what this really leads to is what we call publish or perish. Ah, yes. Or like the culture of publish or perish. I've heard these terms. (laughs) Yeah. So the term Mm. is a lot older than I thought it was. So I guess this has been going on for a very long time. (laughs) Um, But the the term was actually coined in 1932. Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) I thought it was definitely a thing of the 90s. I thought so, too. But, you know, basically Mm -hmm. what publish or perish means is that oftentimes the number of publications, more so than the quality, is used to kind of demonstrate your academic talent. It's used in hiring decisions. And it is also something that can bring in more funding to institutions. So there's quite a bit of pressure on researchers to keep your job you got to keep publishing yeah and I think to get tenure as well like you need to show a certain amount of publication exactly and it's often used as this measure of competency which isn't really true or I guess isn't really direct and one thing that's kind of ironic is that if you focus more on teaching like let's say you're Mm -hmm. trying to be a university professor if a lot of what you do focuses on teaching that's not necessarily something that gets you published but you might be passed over for teaching jobs at universities for people who have more publications Mm. and less teaching experience. Because it's one of the criteria. If you have someone who's a very high-impact researcher, like they'll bring in the money to the university. Mm. Every university wants their university to be the one that has the scientists that found the cure to cancer. Produce the influential research. Exactly, that is going to be splashed on all the pages right? They want their institution to be high impact from a research perspective as much as it does for a teaching. This leads to obvious problems when there's pressure to push research through because research is inherently extremely slow. Oh my goodness. It's like molasses in the Arctic. Yes. (laughs) I once had one of the researchers I worked with during university. He said that research was like 90% labeling tubes and mixing of clear fluids and like 10% fun stuff, like publishing papers. <laughs> and even publishing papers, it's only fun when it when you see your name on the paper and it's published. Like the part where you get the comments back and you're like, oh my goodness, I've worked on this for so long. I can't revisit it, but you have to. <laughs> it's a challenging process. It's one that requires so much discipline to be able mm-hmm. to push through. To a certain extent, if you are going to add to the body of work, you want it to be challenging to a certain extent. Like you want there to be rigor and robustness. But if you are comparing a researcher to a teacher, those are different tracks and different metrics that you, I think you should ultimately use. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, this pressure to publish as much as possible, it can really decrease the value of the projects that are being published. There's people that will, like, split up project into multiple publications because, Mm. you know, there's different components where it could be all one project. It might also cut into the time that you do spend teaching if that's part of your job. Um, And it can lead to wasteful research. So predatory journals that really kind of prey on researchers who are looking to increase their publications. And these are journals that charge publication fees to authors without actually checking the articles for quality and legitimacy. So that whole peer review process we talked about, they don't take. And they end up publishing a lot of stuff that Mm. maybe wasn't ready or wasn't a high enough quality or was even pseudoscience. And it really dilutes research that has gone through a peer review process that is rigorous because now, now you have to wade through the weeds. Yeah. And then if you publish it in what's considered a scientific journal, but there is no peer review behind it and it makes it to mainstream media, like I would be concerned that it hasn't been checked or like it might not be true to the best of our knowledge. And the people who do have expertise in whatever area it is that it's been published in, there's some school of thought that the real peer review process is what does the scientific community think of it when it is published? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the problem is once it's out there, it's out there. No one can be an expert in everything. And it can lead to quite a bit of harm. And it's also expensive. 
<laughs> so I think one thing a lot of people don't realize about academic publishing is that there's pretty much no money in it from the researcher. Like you do all of the project, which hopefully is funded by some sort of grant or company or agency, or it's it's funded somehow to be able to do it. And then you spend all your time working on the project, you write the project up, you send it into the journal, you go through the peer review process. And if you want that paper to be published open access, so it's not behind a paywall, so someone doesn't have to pay $30 to read your article, you often have to pay the publishing fees. And you don't get any money for having an article accepted. Like it costs over five grand to publish an article in Nature, which is a very high impact scientific Mm -hmm. journal. Here's the thing that gets me as well is that reviewers aren't paid. Yeah, I think our peer review process is not perfect for sure. And I think there are ways in which we might want to consider like looking at it and reviewing it to make it more efficient and perhaps cheaper, as you're saying, or maybe like allocate funds for work. But I I do believe that we need some sort of review process. Yes, we absolutely. And that's not a case against peer review. It's just Mm -hmm. when you pull back the curtain on it, it it does demand a lot from, I think, the researcher, from people in the fields. And I think the underlying assumption of it is often that you do it for the good of science, the good of Mm -hmm. medicine, for your own kind of scholarly interests or career. But it's a significant commitment without a lot of compensation. Yes. And of course, there's benefits outside of money. I mean, it's true. There are criticisms to the process and to the impact factors. For example, even though it goes through the peer review process, that doesn't guarantee that it's true. Like you often see papers that are retracted as well. And that actually leads us really nicely into something else that I looked into, which is that there's a quite a strong correlation between impact factor and article retraction, which means that an article is pulled from publication. There was a study published in 2011 in the journal Infection and Immunity called Retracted Science and the Retraction Index. And what they decided to do was they wanted to create a new measure, the likelihood of an article being retracted. So there's a few different reasons an article could be pulled. So it might be that the findings are no longer considered trustworthy due to scientific misconduct, or someone could have made errors, like honest data input errors. That happens. It might be plagiarism. It could have plagiarized previously published work. Or it could be something that violates ethical guidelines. So they created the retraction index, which is the number of retractions in the time interval from 2001 to 2010 when they were doing the study as kind of a an academic exercise. And they multiplied that number by 1,000 and then divided by the number of published articles with abstracts. Why did they multiply by 1,000? The number of retractions multiplied by 1,000 divided by number of publications? I think because the numbers that they had were between one and four. It's just like a way of normalizing it. Yeah, it was a way of normalizing it because like very few articles are retracted when you look at the whole mm-hmm. body of academic publishing. So it was a way to get a number that is actually on like an order of magnitude that makes some sense. <laughs> okay. I guess the number of retractions divided by the total number of articles published by that journal, but then you multiply it by a thousand so that you can like see it in a number that makes sense or on a scale that makes sense. Exactly. And they specifically looked at 17 science and medical journals. And then they tested if there was a correlation between the retraction index and impact factor. And there was. So it was pretty much a straight line (laughs) up. Okay. So like the New England Journal of Medicine has the highest impact factor of the journals they looked at. And it also had the highest rate of retraction. I wonder if there's like a way to normalize it. Because if you're publishing more papers... I guess it is normalized to the amount of papers published because I would expect you're publishing more papers on a whole, therefore you expect to see more retractions and you expect to see more citations as well. Yeah, and I'm not sure necessarily if the journals with the highest impact factors are publishing more than other journals. Like, I think it would vary quite a bit for it. Like, no one really knows (laughs) is the gist of this relationship. But some people thought that getting an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine is like a big career moment for researchers. Mm. So they thought that maybe 
researchers were more willing to cut corners or commit scientific misconduct to get into a prestigious journal, like more likely to fudge the numbers so that it's more novel or more impressive. And the other part of that is papers in high impact journals, it means that there's more eyes looking at it. There's a lot more scrutiny, a lot more replication of experiments. So it really leads to kind of an interesting question of what measure is really a good measure of journals. Mm -hmm. I guess that's something that we're still trying to figure out as well as we're building this body of scientific literature. It's an imperfect process because it's all humans doing it. And hopefully we will only get better. So we've talked about a lot of science this episode, but we still have a science seed for our listeners. Yes. (laughs) So each episode, we like to give our listeners something to think about. A science nugget to help you think more critically about the numbers, statistics, and really the science that you hear every day. So Lev, do you want to take it away? Sure. This episode, we talked a lot about the peer review process. And I think in this podcast in general, we always try to go back to what we call the primary sources or the papers. And the reason that we put so much stock in that is because of the peer review process, because we hope that in that process of reviewing these publications and getting those edits and like making it through this what is considered rigorous process that we will have information that is correct and that doesn't mean that the peer review process isn't flawed and that there isn't room for improvement but it is the reason why we often consider the primary work published in the literature to be the most accurate representation of the findings that's why we put so much stock in it (laughs) (laughs) and that's why we try to present it to you (laughs) Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find the references that we use for this episode in our show notes. A special thank you to Julian Bertino, who does our sound editing and music. If you have a chance, please leave us a review and rate us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It really helps our podcast reach new listeners. Have an idea of what we should cover next? Want to learn more about what we talked about today? Follow us on Instagram at The Secret Life of Numbers. We'll catch you next time on The Secret Life of Numbers, where the numbers can run, but they can't hide. 